نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اما بعد بسبت الاسلام السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته uh, welcome everyone those watching us here in person and those watching on uh, live as well marhaban ahlan wa sahlan let us begin inshallah we're going to be looking today at uh, the tafsir of surah al-duha okay so we are looking at juz amma and this surah consists of 11 verses and there's a lot of benefit in this surah from a number of different perspectives let us begin by reciting it and then we'll break it down inshallah <coughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى ولا الآخرة خير لك من الأولى ونسوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيبا فآوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ <coughs> So respect the listeners, this surah, it has an amazing sabbu nuzul reason of revelation. That the Prophet wasallam in the early part of Mecca, he was going through a lot of hardship. He was going through a lot of trials. And the pagan community in which he was propagating and promoting the message of Islam, that they were not accepting his message and they were increasing the hatred, they were increasing the oppression against the Prophet ﷺ and those who were following this message. The Prophet ﷺ, he lost his blessed uh, wife Khatija, he lost his blessed uncle Abu Talib, and this year that was considered to be a very difficult year was known as the Am al Huzn, the year of great sadness. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ, further to that, there was a moment in which revelation had stopped coming to the Prophet. ﷺ that he was receiving revelation, he was propagating and preaching the message. And the people were saying, this man, he's gone mad. This man, he is a sorcerer. This man, he is a poet. He is making these things up. But he was receiving this from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests all of his servants. And Allah stopped sending down the revelation. The wahi stopped coming down and the Prophet didn't receive something for days, for weeks. And some of the scholars say up to six months that the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't receive any revelation. During this time, the pagans, the Quraysh, his enemies, they started to make a mockery of the Prophet ﷺ. They started to say, where is your God now? Your God has abandoned you. They would say, where is your shayateen? Where is the one who inspires you? Even they have left you, that you have nothing, no one. You're all alone. So the Prophet ﷺ, he went through a period of time where he was extremely sad. He was very low, he had lost people, he wasn't receiving revelation, the time was very, very difficult. Now, one of the reasons to why I've picked this particular surah, <coughs> one of the reasons to why I've picked this particular surah, and we're discussing it now, is the fact that many of us in our lives, we can experience difficulties. And we, can't, we tend to keep our difficulties locked up in our minds. Uh, we can go through some very sad phases. Some of us can fall into depression. Some of us can fall into anxiety. Some of us can get really, really low and get some really evil thoughts in our minds. And what we need to understand that this feeling or feelings, today we would classify that as mental illnesses, uh, that these feelings, these thoughts, uh, that, you, that the person is not alone in these feelings. That the Prophet ﷺ, and we'll come to see as well other Prophets, they also had times where they felt all alone. They also had times where they were alone and they were sad. And had made, they had a lot of losses. So when we relate these stories, we come to find that people today who are suffering from these illnesses, they have something to relate to. And many a times we may think that Islam doesn't have an answer to these problems. And then Islam becomes alien to us. And it's important for us 
to portray and to educate people that Islam has an answer to all of our problems. All of our problems. So mental illnesses, they may have now fancy definitions and terminologies for certain things, but Islam has an answer for all these things. Islam shows us through this beautiful surah, which inshallah ta'ala I will try my best to explain, that Islam shows us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He can take you from your difficult situation and completely change your mindset, completely change your life if you follow His path. So this surah is number one, it is directed at the Prophet ﷺ for his hardship and his difficulty. But at the same time, we do not confine the message to the Prophet ﷺ. Yes, we say primarily Allah is talking directly to the Prophet, but the message is for me and you. So six months the Prophet ﷺ went without any revelation and he faced a lot of hardship. The Prophet ﷺ, one of his biggest opponents was Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl used to make fun of the Prophet and say, look, you're all alone. His uncle, Abu Lahab, he used to make fun of the Prophet and likewise. And he used to say, look, now you've got nothing left. You've got no revelation. Your message has come to an end. The auntie of the Prophet Salam, Umm Jamil, she used to likewise make fun of the Prophet She's her own auntie. So imagine your own blood uncle, your blood auntie, your relatives. They are the ones who are putting you down. So he, has, he was in a situation where he was feeling alone. And I would like to just share with you, uh, before we delve straight into the surah, I'd like to just share with you some statistics or um, some facts that we have to live with today in, in this society uh, when we look at, especially people in the UK, when it comes to mental illnesses, when it comes to feeling alone, or even like people that get really lonely and they may even have suicidal tendencies. Now, I'm not saying this is the case with the Prophet ﷺ. I'm exaggerating, I'm just dragging it out because we don't know where people are on that spectrum. So I'll give you some statistics. So, for example, in 2018, going back a little bit, uh, we find that there was a 6,507 suicides were actually registered in the UK. Now that's a really high number. So that includes Muslims as well. Now, likewise, we tend to find that the stats, they tell us that depression and loneliness is ever on the rise, especially amongst our teenagers. Right? SubhanAllah, our youngsters are feeling more and more depressed. The one in four people are affected by mental health issues each year. 75% of mental illnesses, they start before the age of 18. Our young teenagers are feeling lonely, are feeling all alone. So this is something that we have to discuss and we have to show people that Islam is a solution for that. Likewise, not just that, but how many times have we been in a situation or where we are praying and we're not, really feeling, we're not feeling the impact of that prayer? Or how many times have we been in a situation where we're reading the Qur'an and the Qur'an is not really having that impact? So Ramadan is not far away, and you find the Imam reciting, you're standing behind the Imam, and there's people who are crying, there's people who are moved by the recitation, but nothing's happening to you. Your heart's not moving. And that's a worrying sign. Why am I not crying? Why am I not happy when everybody is happy? Why am I not, why am I not feeling the prayer? So there is that level of disconnect that you have disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you've gone further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we will see this in this verse, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he thought he had been abandoned. He thought that was it, he's not going to receive any more revelation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us through this verse, Allah does not abandon his, his believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with us and always aids us. Now, before we look into the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa let me show you some examples from the Qur'an of how people Righteous people in the Quran, they also felt very lonely, they also felt uh, uh, by themselves, and they went through some very difficult situations, yet they depended upon Allah. Take the example of, the, of Yaqub, السلام, the father of Yusuf. I'm sure you've all read the story, and you all know how much Yaqub, he loved his son Yusuf, السلام, to the point he loved him so much that he cried because he missed him. His own other sons, they attempted to kill him and they threw him in the world. You know the story. When his son was away from him for such a long time, Yaqub cried so much because he missed his son. He cried and he, he, he was all alone, no one to listen to, no one to plead, no one to have any help. So he cried and what would he? He actually lost his eyesight because of the amount he cried. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Yaqub qala innama ashku bathi wa huzni ilallah. That indeed, Yaqub said, I only make my complaints. I only say what I have to say ilallah. I don't go around telling anyone, I only say what I have to say to Allah. And I know from Allah that which you do not know. Meaning he is a prophet. He has hope in Allah. Take another example. Look at the life of Maryam alayhi salam. Now, Maryam, of course, she was not a prophet. But she was the mother of a prophet. And when she was laying or sitting underneath the palm tree, when she was experiencing the pains of labor, what did she say? And these verses are very powerful. So sisters can relate as well. Brothers can relate as well. She said, Qalat. 
at that moment in time when she was about to give birth. قالت يا ليتني مت قبل هذا. She was all alone, and she's giving birth, and she's under a tree. There's no doctors, there's no nurses, there's no medics, there's nothing. She's all alone, and she's feeling low. She's feeling down. There's no support. And she said, قالت يا ليتني مت قبل هذا. She said, if only I had died before this day. She says, if only I had died مت قبل هذا. If only I had died before this event. وقنت نسيا منسيا. And I was, I never existed. So you can see how lonely that's going to affect people. Look at the example of Musa alayhi salam. When Musa alayhi salam, he ran away from Egypt because he had accidentally killed someone. So he was running away. He was fearful for his life. When he heard the information that Pharaoh and his army, they're looking for Musa. They're going to kill Musa. Musa immediately, he ran. He, 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 he left uh, Egypt. He didn't take his money. He didn't take any clothing. Wherever, whatever he had at that time, he used that and he ran away. Without any family, without any wealth, without any possessions. He was alone. He was desperate. He had nowhere to stay. He had nothing. What does he say? The dua of Sayyidina Musa, Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqir. He said, Oh Allah, it is you, Rabbi anzalta, that you have put me in this place, and ilayya min khayrin faqir. I'm faqir. I don't have anything. I don't have a house. I don't have any money. I don't have any food. But he put his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finally, we'll take one more example. Take the example of Yunus alayhi salam. Yunus alayhi salam, when he left his people and he was thrown off the boat and he was in the belly of the whale, he was in the depth of the ocean, in the depth of the night, in the depth of the belly of the whale. He was in a dark place and it said that in the stomach of the whale, a very acidic environment, he was losing his health, he was losing his skin. What did he say? He said, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al -zalimin. He said, La ilaha, there is no deity God worthy of worship except you, anta. Subhanaka, you are the one who is worthy of all praise. Inni kuntu min al Indeed, I was wrong and I made a mistake. So, respected listeners, I wanted to show you those few examples to show that when we go through difficult times in life, we are not alone. When you're feeling sad or lonely, you're not alone. People before you did that, people much better than you did that, and they made it. And they came out much more positive and they came out much more stronger. So, let us have a look. <coughs> when we start from the very beginning, now imagine the Prophet ﷺ, firstly, okay, he is feeling lonely, he is feeling down, he hasn't received revelation, people are criticizing, people are mocking. And I want you to also think of yourself or people you may know today who may be going through similar situations, maybe depression or loneliness or sadness. What's the very first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet? ﷺ? So six months of silence. <coughs> six months of silence, and what's the very first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? He says, Wadduha. What's the power of that? Number one, Wadduha is a qasm. Allah swears by the early part of the day. So once the sun rises, up until that point, till just before Duhr, that time is considered to be the Duha. So some of you may pray the Duha prayer. That's the time. Now, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he makes mention of the Duha? There's a number of reasons we can understand. Number one, what is the most beautiful part of the day? It's the morning part. The most beautiful part of the day is the time where there is sun where you can hear the birds chirping, where you can see the clear skies, where there is no noise except for natural sounds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Wadduha, O person, you may feel lonely, you may feel by yourself, but just look outside, look at this beautiful time, just step outside and see what beauty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for you. It's a day full of light, it's a day full of hope, it's a day where you can start a new beginning, a natural beauty. You can see the mountains, you can see the trees, you can see the rivers and the birds, and you can see, most importantly, the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at these moments. And we come to find in the next verse, Allah says, وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى And by the night which overcomes. So Allah shows the parallel, starting with the morning and then swearing by the night. Now what's the significance of the night? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He makes an oath by the night. What do we understand? So Allah has sworn by the morning and sworn by the night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هو الذي جعل لكم الليل لباسا والنوم سباتا وجعل النهار نشورا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the day and the night. Why Allah created the day? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the night? هو الذي جعل لكم الليل لباسا Allah has created for you the night as a covering. Meaning the night has been created for the human being to rest. To, 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 to stay away from the other activities and to take it easy. One gnome and for you to sleep subata That you take a good sleep. 
nushura. And he made for you the daytime for you to be active, for you to go out and work, for you to go out and study, for you to go out and do whatever you have to do. So Allah tells us the purpose that the nighttime has been created for you to do what? To take a rest. The daytime has been created for you to go and work. Now, what's very common with people who may be feeling a little bit lonely or sad or feeling a little bit depressed, what's common? We tend to find common with these people, what will they do? Their routine is the other way around. We'll find that they sleep very, very late and they wake up when most of the day has already gone. So imagine a person who goes to sleep late, he's awake all night, and you know, half an hour, 45 minutes before Fajr, he goes to sleep. And then when he sleeps, he sleeps throughout the whole day and he wakes up when it's mm, going to start getting dark again. When does that person see light in his life? When does that person experience nur in his life? He's involved, his whole life is dark. So, وَالضُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى The night, the morning time, reflect on the morning. There's beauty, like the Prophet said, there's barakah in the morning time. And then the night time has been created for you too. Uh, to sleep and to take a rest. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting the circle in place that we have these two times. The third verse Allah says, Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. That ma wadda'aka rabbuka, that your Lord certainly has not abandoned you. The accusations that were made against the Prophet was the fact that he'd been abandoned. That they were, they were saying that no one's going to help you. Your Lord, your Lord has left you. The angel that you claim, they used to say shaitan, has left you. You have nothing. You're all alone. And that's common with people who feel lonely and feel by themselves. They say there's no help. There is no support. I'm all by myself. Allah reassures the Prophet ﷺ and he tells him, Ma Your Lord has not abandoned you. Your Lord has, is taking care of you. So those watching and listening, that when you're going through difficult times in life, when you're experiencing health problems, financial problems, whatever problems you're having, marriage problems, you think, I've, I've got no hope. Just remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not abandoned you. مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى وَمَا قَلَى And likewise your Lord, He does not hate you. Rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He loves you. And we can look at it from another perspective as well. <coughs> is that when we look at trials and tests that we go through in our life, whatever it is, that this can be seen on a positive because the Prophet Sallallahu said, إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا If Allah, He loves one of His slaves, ابتلاه, That Allah gives him a test. So if you're being tested, then remember that the Prophet Sallallahu said, Allah tests only those whom Allah loves. So if you're going through a difficult time, don't think Allah has abandoned me. Don't think Allah doesn't care about me. Don't think I'm not important. Rather, Allah isn't saying, I actually love you. And I'm actually just putting you through a little test so you can understand how much I actually love you. Your Lord has not abandoned you, your Lord has not left you. Rather, and He does not hate you. <coughs> your Lord, He loves you and He cares for you. <coughs> now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that the latter part, khayrun is better for you min al-ula than the first part. Now we can look at this from two sides. Let's look at it from a dunya perspective and then we look at it from an akhirah perspective. Firstly, what we find that this surah, many of uh, the scholars they say that this surah was revealed, the, it was the eight, 11th surah in the chronological order, it was the 11th surah to be revealed. So it's very early on. And Allah SWT is saying that the, your latter part of your life is going to be much better, much more success than your early part of your life. Let's compare. In the early part of the Prophet's life, so imagine the 11th surah to be revealed, the Prophet ﷺ was alone, the Prophet ﷺ had a few companions, Sahaba were few, they were secretly studying Islam, learning Islam, propagating Islam, they were doing everything in secret, they were being tortured, they were, being <coughs> they were receiving harassment, they were going through a very difficult time. This was the first part. Allah says, وَلَلْآخِرَةُ The latter part is much better. Now let's jump. Let's jump from the early part of Mecca and let's go to the latter part of Medina. When you get to the latter part of Medina, in the ninth year of the Prophet's hijrah, what happened in the ninth year? In the ninth year, the Prophet did what? Fath Mecca, the conquest of Mecca. And what happened in the conquest of Mecca? <coughs> so Hassan, you got some water. In the conquest of Mecca, what do you find? You find that the, 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 the Prophet sallam, now he wasn't <coughs> sorry, now he wasn't alone or with a few companions, but Fath Mecca, he actually uh, had the whole of the peninsula, Mecca, Medina, all under his control. The Prophet ﷺ now, he had thousands of people embracing Islam. Thousands of people, all tribes coming to accept Islam and to pledge allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
Prophet Muhammad Sallam, just wait. Prophet Muhammad just see what is going to happen. Right now you're going through difficulty, but the later part, al akhirah is going to be much better for you. Meaning the latter part of your life is going to be much, much better for you. That's and, and that's what was said to the Prophet Sallam. So now I ask you, respected listeners, Zakhla Khir. So respect this, I ask you at the same time that when you're going through difficulties, when you're going through your struggles, remember this verse as well. Meaning, right now you're struggling, right now you're suffering in your marriage, in your life, in your money, in your health, whatever it is. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, just be patient and in a matter of time, you will see victory, you will see success, you will see betterment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that. And when we look at it from this second angle, that in the dunya, Oh Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that you are few in number, you're going through a bit of difficulty, but the akhirah, meaning the hereafter, is going to be much better for you. And especially as we're in the month of Rajab, uh, you know, as many of the scholars they say, there's no confirmation, but many of the scholars say this is the month in which the night journey of Isra al Mi'raj took place. Like I said, the scholars they differ on the date and even the month, but let's just go with what is commonly understood that it happens in Rajab. That look at the honor Allah gave to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That at one moment in time, he was alone. People were throwing stones at him. People were persecuting him. We know in the early part of Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ, once he was praying in front of the Kaaba, as he was praying, Abu Jahl thought it'd be funny to, to pull a prank on the Prophet ﷺ. So he gathered his people, and at that day there was a celebration, so people were doing a lot of sacrifice. They were sacrificing camels. So he said to them, go to one of the houses, and go bring the skin and the intestines and the stomach of the camel. The camel was massive. So they thought it'd be funny. So they went and brought all of it. When the Prophet ﷺ went into sujood, they came and they threw it on the back of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ was so heavy, he struggled to get up. And we find that there was a few companions that were watching, and they were so scared to even intervene, because the pagans, they were armed and there was a lot of them. The only person that came forward and helped the Prophet ﷺ in this very difficult time was none other than a 9 or a 10 year old girl. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, she came from far and with her small hands she removed all of this off the back of the Prophet and she cried. She said, you do this to him simply because he worships Allah. You do this because he worships Allah. So, coming back to the point, the early part of the Prophet's life was very very difficult and then look at the Akhirah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he took <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he took the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on a miraculous night journey to the point we had, he ascended up into the heavens all the up from the first level to the second to the third, up until the seventh level, where the Prophet ﷺ, he met the different prophet, the different prophets. After the seventh level, he continued to go up, and he looked behind and he didn't see Jibril. He said to Jibril, "Why are you not with me? Why are you not continuing on with the journey?" Jibril said, "I can't go any further. No one has gone this far. Only you have this privilege, Sidratul Muntaha, that he has gone to the furthest point, and there the Prophet ﷺ, he went further, and Subhanallah." The Prophet Muhammad he spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he was asked, did you see him? The Prophet describes, I just saw light, I saw nur. So look how Allah subhanahu wa he says, وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى That the latter part of your life from a dunya perspective was much better. He conquered the whole of the peninsula. When you look at it from an akhirah perspective, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he took him up to the heavens and Allah Almighty spoke to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, what we can extract from this, understanding the sequences or the events that happen in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, that we can also understand from this, is that our lives, we should also be very optimistic. As humans, we are very hasty. We want quick results. You know, how many times you know, we, we hear people come and they ask us, Oh, Imam, you know, I've been making dua and my duas are not answered. You say, okay, so how long has it been? Maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe a year. What, you put an expiry date on your duas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answer when he wants to answer the dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he will answer it. Yeah, have confidence in the fact that he will answer your du'as. Either he will give you exactly what you're asking, or he will give it to you but he will delay it. Or if the du'a you're making is actually not good for you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate that for you and give you something else. And he will also give it to you in the hereafter. So we have to understand and be optimistic in that Allah Almighty, he responds to all of our du'as and all of our uh, uh, affairs. <clears throat> we can also learn from that when we look at um, when we look at the situation of the Muslims around the world. One may think, and one may be feeling a little bit lonely, a little bit depressed, a little bit sad. 
When we see what is taking place around the world, especially with current events, we see what's happening in India, we see what's happening in Syria, we see what's happening in other places. And somebody, you know, very easily you can fall into depression, you can fall sad. SubhanAllah, look at the crimes that are taking place. Look at the brutality and broad daylight that is taking place. Look at all these, these clips that come on my phone. It's so sad and they're so gruesome the way people are being treated. But we say again and again, that maybe right now they're being transgressive, maybe right now they're being oppressive. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He promises the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, victory. And that is part and parcel of our aqeedah, that the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will always be victorious in this world. So this verse, it gives us a lot of hope. Even for those who are going through health problems, right? You might be going through some really serious health issues. Keep your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will fix it. You're going through some financial problems. Just keep patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cure such issues. Now, <coughs> one time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was asleep and Abdullah bin Mas'ud, if I get the name right, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he came to visit the Prophet Sallam, or a companion came to visit the Prophet Sallam, and he, he saw the Prophet Sallam sleeping, and when the Prophet got up, the side of the Prophet Sallam, he could see marks of the leaves that he had been sleeping on. That he slept on something as rough as leaves. And when he saw this, the, the, the companion said to the Prophet Sallam that the kings of Persia and the kings of Rome, they sleep on silk beds and comfortable mattresses and they have all these things and you Rasulullah you are the best of mankind and you're sleeping on leaves you're sleeping on the floor and you burst into tears and the Prophet ﷺ, what did he say Qala, mali wa mali dunya. he said what is it to me and what is this dunya what have I got to do with this dunya Ma ana fi dunya illa shajaratin, thumma raha wa tarakaha. he says a beautiful statement and everyone should take you know note of this statement he said, Ma ana fi dunya, what's my importance or significance of dunya? What do I want from this dunya? I am just a raqib, I am just a traveller. Istadalla tahta shajra. I've just taken a bit of shade under a tree. When a traveller is going on a journey, he stops under a tree, takes a bit of shade, rests, and then continues to his journey. Likewise, the Prophet he's in this dunya, he sees himself on a journey. And his end, final place of or his destination is Jannah. So if you're traveling, why would you want to travel heavy? Why would you want so many suitcases? You would want to travel light. You would want to go easy. And the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us that through these verses. <coughs> <coughs> Furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ also tells us about the dunya and its and the traps of this dunya. He says, In the dunya hulwatun khadira. Indeed, the dunya, it's very green. It's lush. You know, you, you want it. Right, green and, and uh, hulwa means sweet and khadra means green. That when we see the dunya, we all want a bit of the dunya. No matter how much we deny it, we want a piece of it. It looks so attractive. And the Prophet is saying that this temptation is very limited. This temptation, you might enjoy it for a few minutes, for a few seconds, but it's very, very limited. So Allah is telling us that the hereafter is far better than, the, than this world. And likewise, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi uh, he once said, Kun fi dunya ka or Be in this dunya as if you're a stranger or if you're passing by. And know for a fact that the hereafter is far better than what you have in this world. Yes, we, we don't abandon this dunya, we take our means, we take what we're going to do, but ultimately everything we're doing is for the end, uh, the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us that the promise of Allah, the akhirah that we're all working to get to, it's far better than this dunya. And Allah describes it in, <coughs> in Ashab al Jannah till yawm fi shukhul and fakihun. Allah says, indeed, Ashab al Jannah, the inhabitants of Jannah al yawm today, fi shukhul and fakihun. They are busy in celebrating, they are busy in enjoying the pleasures of paradise. Hum wa azwajuhum fi zalalin ala araiki muttaki'un. That these, in, the people of paradise, with their spouses, they're on araik, they're on thrones. They're on, on, on uh, furniture, muttaki'un, and they're reclining back. When you're going to Jannah, Allah says, this is what he's going to give you. Reclining, you're relaxed, no problems. Allah will give you in the Jannah the fruit and may yadda'un, all the things that you'd like, all the things that you'd want. Salamun, qawlan min rabbir rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you will have salam, you will have peace. But what's important here, Allah says, salamun. You will have peace. The call, the statement is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will ensure that you have permanent uh, peace. Now, <clears throat> moving on to the next verse, verse number five. 
wala sawfa yu'tika rabbuka fatarda wala sawfa indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will give yu'tika he will give you O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam rabbuka fatarda he will give you so much that you will be happy that you don't despair O believer addressing the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the rest of us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you so much there will be no need for you to despair Allah will take you out of your distress and he will change your life and he will give you exactly that which you want when it comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah gave the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam many gifts from amongst them, we just talked about Isra wal Mi'raj and likewise we also uh, see that Allah gave what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Al-Kawthar, He gave him the river which is inside of paradise exclusive for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He will give us much much more further to that further to that one of the things or the main thing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted that would make him very very happy was what? was the fact that he wanted people to embrace Islam. He wanted people to follow Islam. He wanted people to go to paradise. This was the biggest thing for the Prophet <coughs> The Prophet when he was uh, in the latter part of his life, he was passing away. And the Prophet is reported to say, he was seen crying, he was seen upset, and asked, uh, what is making the Prophet upset? What was he saying at those moments? He would say, Ummati, Ummati, my nation, my nation. The Prophet was so concerned about me and you, so concerned he would cry over us. He would say, Ummati, Ummati. And this, subhanAllah, we as Muslims today, do we have that concern, not just for ourselves, where are we going to be in the hereafter, but as your nation, like your community here, the, the Muslims in the UK, the Muslims in the world, do we have any care and concern for the Ummah? The Prophet would say, Ummati, he was always concerned for the affairs of the believers. So much so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave him another gift. And that is the shafa'ah of the Prophet ﷺ. That in the hereafter, the Prophet ﷺ will be able to intercede on your behalf. If you qualify and you have that shafa'ah, Allah can, the Prophet ﷺ can intercede on your behalf. Likewise, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, Wala sawfa yu'tika rabbuka fatarda, Allah will give you that which makes you happy. In the, in the dunya, he won the battles. He had the conquest of Mecca. He gained all of those lands. All, <coughs> all those people, they fell under his control. So Allah gave him all that which he wanted for tarba and he will be happy. Likewise, Yom al Qiyamah, when all the nations will come forward, the Prophet will come with their people. The Prophet will come with no followers. The Prophet will come with one follower, two followers. But the Prophet that will have the largest ummah will be Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the biggest of all. Musa Alayhi Salam will be in second place with the people, with the Bani Israel. But the biggest of nations will be that of the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is exactly what Allah said وَلَا صَوْفَ يُعْتِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى And likewise today brothers and sisters when you're upset, when you're lonely, when you're down Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says وَلَا صَوْفَ يُعْتِيكَ Allah is going to give you and you can, when He gives you, you're going to be so happy I relate to a real story one of my Qur'an teachers when we were uh, back in Egypt one of our Qur'an teachers he got married and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala tested him for a number of years, four, five, six years, that he never had any children. And whenever people would come and study Quran at his hands, he would also always make sure to tell his students to make dua. He'd also make dua that Allah blesses me with children because he was unable to have children. The doctor had said this, it's not going to be possible. But he didn't give up. And he continued and continued. I left Egypt, came back here, and I think seven years into his marriage, subhanAllah, he calls and I spoke to him over the phone and he said, Today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with twins right? if you connect with Allah if you trust in Allah you the promises of Allah Allah didn't give him one Allah gave him twins so so when Allah is going to give you he'll give you so much that you'll be so happy and those of us who maybe have lived a little bit of life you will see that in your own life now you went through hardship but then subhanAllah Allah changed your qadr your, your life it went in a different direction Allah gave you in return so we should not feel too lonely when we're by ourselves or depressed and so on and so forth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will take you out of this situation. The next verse, Alam yajidaka yatiman fa awa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us now, He gives examples. So when Allah says that, Wala sofa yatika rabbuka fa tarda, Allah will give you so much that you will be happy. Allah now gives examples to prove that. It's not just a statement. Allah says, I'll prove this to you. Alam yajidaka yatiman fa awa. Did we not find you, O Muhammad sallallahu as a yatim? He was an orphan for awa, and then we made you strong, we raised you. Now, <coughs> we've got to understand these verses. In the tribal society that the Prophet was born into, there was no law, there was no order. 
there was all the tribalistic society. And they called this time, prior to the Prophet, the time of Jahiliyyah, because it was really an ignorant place. They would kill each other for silly things. Uh, they, the way they interacted, men and women, uh, the, the prostitution, crime, uh, all sorts were rife in the, at this time. It was a very barbaric society. When the Prophet came, he changed society. He changed it from darkness into light. Now, in this society, if you don't come from a strong tribe, if you don't have a strong backing, then you don't have much hope in that society. Now, look at this. The Prophet ﷺ, he was an orphan. When he was born, when he was in the stomach of his mother, his father passed away. So he was born yetim. He never saw his father. Then his mother, when he was six years old, his mother passed away. Now, just imagine that, subhanAllah, at six when a child is vulnerable, when he needs his mother the most, his mother passes away. So he's lost his father, he's lost his mother. Then his grandfather takes over and looks after him. Two years down the line, Abdul Muttalib passes away. So he built a relationship with his grandfather and that also went. So imagine this child, eight, nine-year-old child, imagine his feelings of how he's been brought up. And then his uncle takes responsibility of the Prophet ﷺ and he raises the Prophet ﷺ. And then we find much later on, even then his uncle passes away as well. So when Allah says, Alam yajidka yatiman, Allah is saying, oh reflect on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi You were born a yatim in this society, in this environment. There is no universal credit. There is no housing benefit. <laughs> there is no council houses. It's a, it's a desert. And there's a, he's a yatim. So he's the most vulnerable people. But Allah says, yeah, as an orphan, we raised you and we brought you up. And now look at your position. And now look where you are. So even when you're in the most difficult of situations, brothers and sisters, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can protect you and take you out of those. Allah gives another example. وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى And we find you, the word da literally means that you're astray, you're lost, right? Now, of course, the Prophet was never astray, but what it means when he said, وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى Now, the Prophet was lost in the sense that he wanted to guide his people, but he didn't know the how. So when you would look into Mecca, and you see the, the practices that people used to do, stealing, cheating, lying, uh, you know, all this gambling, drinking, all the vice of society, the Prophet didn't like it. And that's why the Prophet used to leave the society and used to go up into a cave. And used to spend days there, sometimes months there, because all these problems, it just was too much for the Prophet He wanted a way out. He wanted to fix the problems. Allah says, well, we're like a ball, then, That we found you not knowing which way to turn. Not knowing how to guide the people. For hada, and then Allah guided you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He turned you, He gave you wahi, He gave you Quran, He gave you guidance, He taught you now how to take people out of this difficult situation and how to bring them into light from the depth and the evils of shirk to the beauty and the brightness of Tawheed. He took people out of oppression and He brought them into light. Likewise, we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He explains this very verse in another verse. One of the best ways to do tafsir, by the way, is tafsir al-Qur'an bil-Qur'an. That when you're looking at verses in the Qur'an, I want to explain what they mean. The primary source you look at is the Qur'an itself. Look in other verses that explain that. And if you don't find it there, you can go to other sources. Now, so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَوَجَدَكَ الضَّالًا فَهَدَى Allah explains that in Surah Shura, verse 52, where he says, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا And like that, Allah inspired you, Ruhan, with Jibreel, from Allah's command. مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابِ وَلَا الْإِيمَانُ وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا تَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ نَشَاءَ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا وَإِنَّكَ لَتَهْدِي إِلَى صِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there was a point you didn't know وَلَكِنْ أَوْحَيْنَا We gave you wahi, we gave you guidance, we sent you Jibreel مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانُ You didn't know what was this book, nor did you know the true essence of Iman Allah gave this to you فَهَدَى Allah gave you these gifts وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا And Allah made it a source of light تَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ نَشَاءُ And Allah guides through this light whomever He wants So the Prophet ﷺ was guided there again Let's move to verse number 8 <coughs> In verse number 8 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى And we found you O Muhammad ﷺ So we're still proving that verse Allah is just showing examples when he says, That Allah is going to make you better. Your latter part of your life is much better than the early part of your life. So Allah has proven that to him, that you are yatim, now look where you are. You didn't know how to guide the people, now you know how to guide the people. Then Allah says, That we found you poor, you didn't have much. Then we say, Then we made you wealthy. Al ghina is wealth, then we made you wealthy. We put you in a position. Now, so what do we find from this? Number one, 
the Prophet وسلم, when he was being raised, he's a yatim, so he doesn't have much wealth. And even his tribe, uh, he was looked after by Abu Talib, even this tribe, it wasn't the most wealthiest of tribes, so they didn't have much. And not just that, but Abu Talib himself, he had many children, so he had a lot of responsibilities. The Prophet وسلم, at the young age of 10 or 11, he himself decided to go seek work and fend for himself. He didn't depend on Abu Talib, so he became a shepherd. And he worked looking after sheep and he fended for himself. That he didn't have much, right? The shepherd doesn't have much. Then the Prophet وسلم, his next job after that was what? Then he moved over into business. That he would work in businesses, and we know that because Abu Talib, he took the Prophet وسلم, as a young man on a business trip to Sham, right? Those of you who read the Sirah, you know the journey that he went to Sham and the people he met on Sham, and they said, This is somebody special, take care of this man. So we know that. So he, he dealt with business. So he was still relatively poor, he didn't have much. Then in his business dealings, because he was Sadiq al Amin, he was the most trustworthy, the most responsible, he never broke his promise, he didn't cheat, he didn't gamble, he didn't steal people's money, he was honest. And his honesty then led him uh, to come under the eyes <coughs> of Khadija. Khadija radiallahu she realized he's an honest man and she needed someone to work for her, so she employed the Prophet. And when she really saw his integrity and his dedication to work, then she proposed and she married the Prophet and then through that we find that the Prophet slowly he pulled back on work and Khatija anha she started to help the Prophet financially so he was able to do that one more he was able to do more work so she, he, the Prophet went from being an orphan Allah says وَوَجَدَكَ we found you somebody who was poor you didn't have much for aghna and then we gave you wealth the wealth of Khadija so he had some wealth now once again that doesn't mean the Prophet became wealthy but it means he came into a position where he was not dependent right being ghani being rich it means that you're in a position where you're not dependent upon other people you're not dependent upon other people likewise we say that we find you didn't have much and then you became aghna when we look at the early part of the life of the Prophet وسلم, we find that he didn't have much, didn't have many followers, he was a few in number, then jump 23 years down the line, we find the Prophet وسلم, when it comes to Fatih Mecca, when it comes to the Battle of Tabuk, when it comes to these great battles, they came back with so much money, they didn't even know what to do with it. They became so wealthy, he was the governor of the whole peninsula, he had so much money, the Muslims had so much wealth, they didn't know how to do it. Allah says, وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى we found you as an orphan, and then we gave you so much more. Now, then we find in the, la the latter part of this verse, Allah then gives the antidote. He gives the solution to depression or feeling down or feeling lonely. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? فَأَمَّ الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَبْحَرْ So the first thing that he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that if you're feeling lonely, if you're looking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help, number one, فَأَمَّ الْيَتِيمَ As for the orphans, don't push them away. Don't treat the orphans in a bad way. Like I said before, the most vulnerable people in any society are the orphans. Especially at that time, even still to this day. You know, an orphan, imagine, he doesn't have that luxury of being hugged by his mother, being hugged by his father, and those gifts, you know, going out and all the rest of it. They, they live a bit of a different life. So the first thing Allah says, فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ Meaning to give back, right? You want to fix your situation, look after the vulnerable people in your society. Look around you and see who is vulnerable. So first and foremost is addressing the yatim. But we can expand and we can say, look, look around and see who is needy and try to aid those who are needy. فَأَمَّا A sail is the one who asks you for money. So if somebody asks you for money, don't turn them away. Right? There's nothing. If you want to come out of your difficult situation, if somebody asks you for something, do not turn them away. Of course, you know, now in, in the climate that we live in, you've got to check that the person is genuine. Of course, sometimes you find people that are just faking it. But in general, number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't turn away the orphan. And number two, don't turn away the beggar. You don't know where the next meal is going to come from. And the very final verse, and I think the, the prayer started. You can finish the last Okay. Time. So the very final verse, inshallah, and another five minutes, inshallah. The final verse, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَاتِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ As for the blessings that Allah has given you, the ni'm that Allah has given you, فَحَدِّثْ Then speak about them. Okay. Now, this verse, it's talking about the blessings Allah has given us that we should express them. Now, this is not in the sense of showing off. All right? If Allah has given you wealth, or Allah has given you health, or Allah has given you children, and it's not talking that you show off about these things, but rather, without any kibr, without any riyah, that you speak about them in a positive way. So there's no harm in that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah, Allah is beauty, and He loves to see beauty. 
So if you're wealthy, then you should dress good, right? You should smell good. You, you should be kept in a, in a good way. So if you have those blessings, you should reflect those blessings. Likewise, another uh, understanding of this, when the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يشكر الله من لا يشكر الناس So one of the things that if a person is not truly grateful unto Allah, you don't appreciate the blessings that Allah has given you unless you thank the people themselves. Because the people are part and parcel of the success that you have. So being grateful for them. <coughs> now, the main point here when it comes to this verse, فَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ That speak about the virtues that Allah has given you. Whatever blessings Allah has given you, you should use those blessings to give back. So for example, Allah has given you intelligence, then you should use that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has given you wealth, use that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has given you knowledge, use that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the best way for hadith, to speak about it. Okay? It is not to show off at all. Now, so uh, finally, I just want to leave with a few pieces of advice. Right, so we've understood generally the Surah Duha. We can go into much more depth, but I think that suffices here. And we mentioned that the verse it directly speaks to the Prophet وسلم, as well as the Surah after it, uh, uh, صدرك, that refers to the Prophet. وسلم. But we can drive lessons from that ourselves in, in, in our lives, those who are going through a downtime in their lives, those who are going through difficulties. So, just to conclude, so some solutions for us that we can take out of this Surah. Number one, is that each one of us, if we want to come out of our difficulties in life, we have to primarily turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has the solution to your problems. Like Yaqub alayhi salam, what did he say? قَالَ إِنَّمَا أَشْكُ بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ That when I have difficulties, I take my difficulties and my complaints to Allah. I only ask Allah. I don't go to the people and tell them about my problems. Right? I keep it and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So number one, any situation whether you've got an exam, whether it's health, whether it's marriage, finance, whatever it is, turn to Allah and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will take you out of that difficulty. Number two, the second solution to the situation that you're in and you want to get out of it is the salah. The salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ salah." That when you're in difficulties, rely upon the, rely upon sabr, patience, and rely upon a salah. Turn back to the prayer. You know, the Prophet sallam, Whenever he would uh, feel a little bit down or a little bit worried, he would say, Ya Bilal, arihna bis salah bil adhan or Bilal, call the prayer. Whenever he was down, the, the thing that he would do to feel comfort, to chill out, was the salah. For us today, the salah is a bit of a burden, right? You've got to get to the masjid, you've got to make wudu, it's difficult for us. We, oh God, I've got to pray again. But for them, the prayer was the place where they relaxed. They would gather together and say, What should we do? Let's go pray. So they would find ease in the prayer. They would find comfort in the prayer. They would find comfort in the recitation of the Quran. That was their lives. So we come to find here. And likewise, like I said, the month of Rajab, uh, we, we, talk, we touched on the issue of Isra, Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj. One of the biggest lessons that we can take out of the night journey was this is where the Prophet ﷺ was given the gift of the Salah. Right? So don't forget that this was the gift given to the Prophet ﷺ was the Salah. And when the Prophet ﷺ was given the gift, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, go tell your people that you're going to pray 50 times a day. Now you're smiling. Yeah? He said 50 times a day. When the process was coming down, he met Musa. Musa, what did Musa say to him? Musa Alayhi Salaam said to him, Ya Muhammad, what, what, what did you get? What happened? He said, Allah has given me an amazing gift. Allah has given me 50 prayers a day. Musa said, stop. He said, go back to Allah, get a discount. Get, change this. They, these people are not, you're, I know, Bani Israel, I have experience. Your people are not going to pray 50 times a day. So the Prophet ﷺ goes back up to Allah and he asks for a reduction. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reduces it to 45. He comes back down, he sees Musa. He says, Ya Musa, uh, 45. Musa says, no way. Your prayer people are never going to pray 45 times a day. Go back up and ask for the reduction. He goes up and it goes to 40. He tells Musa about 40. Musa says, no way. The Prophet ﷺ continues this journey back and forth from 40, 35 to 30, all the way down till 5. He comes down, he says to Musa, Ya Musa, uh, Allah has given me the command for five prayers. Musa says to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa go back. They're not going to pray five times a day. Go and get it reduced further. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he said, I'm too shy to go back and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for any further reduction. And whoever prays the five daily prayers, they'll be given the reward as if they prayed 50 prayers a day. Subhanallah. 50 prayers a day. And yet, again, if we were genuine, we ask ourselves the question, as a percentage, Muslim ummah, how many are praying five times a day? 
20, 30 men. Yeah, 20%. Yeah, okay. So Musa was right. Right? Musa al Islam was right. The people, they're not going to do five daily prayers every day. So we find again, one of the solutions is the fact that we turn back to the, the prayer. Now, and I'll wrap up with just two more things. Number one is that person, if you want to be successful in this life, if you want to come out of difficulties in this life, number one, keep your eyes on the prize. Meaning in your life, always keep focused on Jannah, the hereafter. No matter any decision that you make, Jannah and the hereafter should be the main thing that derives you to make a decision on that yes or no. لَا يَمُسُّهُمْ فِيهَا نَصْبٌ وَمَا هُمْ مِنْهَا بِمُخْرِجِينَ Keep your eyes focused on the hereafter and know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will guide you. Brothers and sisters, inshallah, we would, uh, I'm going to stop there. Um, if we had time, we can take questions, but I don't think there is time. So inshallah, we, we will stop there, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. Allah ma ja'alna bimman yistami'oon al-qawla fi yattabi'oon ahsana. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana qina adhab al-nar. Allah ma salla Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim innaka hamidu majid. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.